And I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so welcome everyone to our webinar, Mobile Therapy Practices for Older Adults. What is all the hype about? Can you guys see my screen? Does it show the slides? Okay, okay, perfect. Um, and yeah, I have got very sunburned today. My son's baseball game, oh my gosh, I didn't think it was ever gonna end. It was like 10 to one. And of course I didn't take sunscreen, so very bad. And my friends didn't have it there either. So um, anyways, welcome, welcome. I'm so excited. This is um, my love and area of practice that I do myself, as well as I love helping other therapists learn more about it and help them start their practice. Um, I'll get into a little bit more about who I am and the next level and all of that kind of stuff because I know some of you are new to us, but a lot of you um, are familiar names that I've seen before. So yeah, um, if you haven't heard of mobile therapy we and hybrid practice, we are going to dive deep into this today and really why PTs, OTs, speech therapists, um, even OTAs, PTAs are really great professions to start this type of practice. And we're going to talk about why we need to be starting these types of practices. And we'll touch base on how to do it and how to make sure you guys are successful with that. And um, we'll go through the objectives and so forth um, as we get going. And I'm going to be looking back and forth because I have a dual screen here. So, so first, let's talk about our wonderful panelists. So um, Sue will be joining us soon, but I am going to actually have Rachel go ahead and introduce herself. Um, Rachel. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for having me tonight, Kara. I appreciate it. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am um, an occupational therapist who's certified in skills to care. Um, so that's what I'm going to be talking about later this evening. But I do have um, two small businesses, one small practice that I've had operating since 2017, day by day home therapy. I work only with individuals with some form of dementia and their care partners. Um, also a mobile med B practice uh, or mobile outpatient practice, I should say, um, and doing a hybrid model. So I do a lot of telehealth these days um, since the start of the pandemic, which has been a really um, unique and interesting experience. Um, I named my practice day by day home therapy uh, because of the family experience that I have. So um, my mom's mom, so my grandmother on my mom's side, she actually passed away with dementia and so did her siblings. Their maiden name was Day. Um, so that's why I named my practice Day by Day Home Therapy. Um, and my mom is my office manager. So it's a nice little family business. Um, and we are based in the Philadelphia suburbs. Um, and then I have another small practice where I, I train other occupational therapists to do this type of work in um, dementia care. Thank you so much, Rachel. Is anyone here interested with working with older adults with dementia and their caregivers? If you could let us know in the um, comment section, that um, would be awesome. Okay, great. So um, Rachel is amazing. I came upon the skills to care program over a year ago. I went through the training, I think last May, April, we started it. And it is literally the perfect fit for a mobile hybrid practice. And we're going to talk about more, um, more about that later today, but yeah, wealth of knowledge. Um, yeah, I just can't say more about Rachel and her practice and how knowledgeable she is and how well she helps us as occupational therapists be able to um, better help people with dementia, caregivers with um, that are caring for clients with dementia. So yes, this will be recorded so you can go ahead and, um, you know, watch it at a later time. So I'm still waiting for Sue Doyle. So I... Rachel, if you see her pop in, let me know and we'll get her on for introductions. So, 
So for those of you that do not know me, my name is Kara Welke. I am an occupational therapist, 21 years now, scary. Um, I have worked in a wide variety of settings. And for the last um, three years now, I've had my own mobile practice. Prior to that, I taught in an occupational therapy assistant program for about eight years. And during that time, I also continued to work in um, a skilled nursing facility, transitional care unit, did some outpatient work. Um, and I honestly, it wasn't until I went I went back to school until I started teaching um, in the occupational therapy assistant program that I really realized how unoccupation based and client centered a lot of occupational therapy professionals um, are, including even myself. I mean, I always thought I was a pretty decent occupational therapist. Um, and once I started teaching and really getting back into um, the meat of our profession and teaching students how to be client centered and occupation based, I feel like I really grew as a professional and knew that I wanted more for my clients and myself. And one of the biggest things that really bothered me was when um, occupational therapy, our students came back from field work and they're like, no one does it how you teach us. No one does client center. No one does occupation based. All we see is the UBE, their band, you know, things like that. Um, and you know, there was lots of things that happened. I mean, I got frustrated. I, start, I started this movement with fieldwork edu educators on how can we increase fieldwork sites that are more client-centered, occupation-based, so forth. Um, I was getting my doctorate at the time. I created a, a program in the skilled nursing facility I was in called Active Engagement in Life. And I mean, that was awesome and amazing. But I realized that unless you do it yourself, um, it's not going to get done how you want it to be. So that's the big reason why I started my own business is I knew I could provide therapy services um, to clients in our area um, that was client-centered, occupation-based, and really help them reach the goals in their life. Plus, um, as I shared earlier today, it also allows um, me to be able to have a flexible schedule so I don't miss all my kids' events and so forth. But when you're running your own practice, you can do it the way you want to do it. Um, and I can't tell you the number of times a day or the days per week that I hear from my clients. Why haven't other therapists done this? Why are you the first therapist that's ever done this? I'm like, it should be done all the time. I'm not doing anything that is out of the ordinary. This is what you should get for therapy. Um, so when you are able to run your own business, you can provide the best quality of care possible. And Sue, and Kara, um, Sue has, uh, she's joined us and it's her name listed. So I think we should. Be oh, it is. Go. Okay. Let's see. Oh, there you are, Sue. So that's a little bit about myself and then we'll get Sue in here so she can introduce you. And I know she was out busy today. Hello. Hey, I think we made it this time. I was on when you started, but obviously it wasn't working. So I can't <laughs> with that link. You're good. Go ahead and introduce yourself, Sue, and tell them all about you and your business. So um, I am Sue Doyle. I'm an occupational therapist that's had 40 years of experience as an occupational therapist. Um, I trained in Australia because I'm Australian. I do have my PhD, as crazy went back to school. I've taught for 11 years in academia, published on stroke sensory impairment, done all kinds of things. This is my second time with a private practice. Um, I had one in Australia probably about three years after I graduated, um, which was mixed adults and peds, which again is what I'm doing right now. Um, I'm focusing on home modifications. I've had this practice six years. And uh, keeping very busy, I hired my first staff person last week and planning to hire more, yes, an admin assistant. And I have to tell you, it's such a relief. And um, yeah, it's um, moving forward and really exciting. And I just 
got back from seeing clients and I have two more faxes on my fax machine that are referrals with people. I don't even know where they came from. So just a little background. I've been on Sue's case to hire for a long time because <laughs> she's very, very busy and needs, um, needs the support. So that's awesome. Um, I'm excited. I, I helped set up a free clinic and I was director of operations there for a while. It's a mixed medical clinic, um, which we have therapists as well as chiropractors, nurse practitioners, nurse dietitians, et cetera. And so I run a chronic pain program for there and have done now for seven, eight years. And so I do that as well as um, stuff with Next Level. And I see 16 to 20 clients in their homes a week. And Sue also has um, been very busy working on our new home modification certification that you'll learn more about um, later tonight and um, also doing a webinar specifically on home modifications assessments next week that we'll be talking about as well. So, um, so yeah, I, these two are so extremely knowledgeable and valuable that I am very appreciative to have you both here. So let's get into it. Um, on the slides, I don't, I do not um, really have a lot of too much content on there because those that of you that know me, I mean, I like to talk, all three of us can talk. So um, ask us questions, post it in the chat as we go, and we will, um, you know, try to get your questions answered as we go through. Oops, wrong way. Okay, so we have quite a few objectives for today. So we're gonna learn why OTPT and SLP professions are the perfect profession to run this type of practice. What is a mobile hybrid practice and why is that needed? Learn the different specialty areas you can focus on in this type of practice. Learn what an age-friendly therapy clinic is. Learn about the certifications that complement this type of practice. And everyone always wants to know how much money you can make in this type of practice. So we will talk about that as well. And we'll probably touch on some more things as well. So I am adamant that OTs, PTs, speech therapists, this is the perfect practice to start if you want to start your own business and you love working with older adults. Okay, so if you're on here and you're a pediatric therapist, you know, so forth, we're, we're not going to talk about it for you guys. We're really focusing in on the older adult population and why our therapy professionals are a perfect fit for this type of business. And especially with the lack of training that we all get in school, why starting this type of practice is much better than like a big outpatient clinic type situation. So before I even change the screen, let's hear from you guys. Why do you think we are the perfect professionals to start this type of practice? Don't all post in the chat at once. What are some reasons that OTs, PTs, OTAs, PTAs should be starting this type of practice? Yes, we're person-centered, already have experience with senior population, holistic, client-centered, holistic practitioners. Good, lots of people focus on client-centered and holistic. Yes, Ashley, best place to address ADLs is in the home, exactly, in their own environment. Um, we understand the function at home. We know, we know the job better than our corporation. Yes, those are all excellent answers um, and there's probably so many more than what we're even going to talk about so <laughs> um, yes we do okay so a few things that I just want to mention so this population is only getting bigger and we can't meet the need now and the need is only going to grow um, so today there are over Today, there are more than 46 million older adults, 65 and older, and by 2030, one in five Americans is expected to be over 65. There is an increased need to support adults as they age. I mean, COVID really brought this out. 
I mean, we always knew, I think, that people want to age in place, right? Um, but more than ever, people are wanting to stay at home, live at home, figure out how they can avoid going into an assisted living facility, avoid going into the nursing home. And, you know, there were several people that in our practice over the last year, we brought people home from the nursing home and assisted living and helped them and their families be able to figure out how they could stay in their home. Um, and this need is, is just going to continue to grow. Um, some people prefer services in their home or they cannot get out to appointments. So again, I am absolutely adamant that a mobile practice is perfect for the older adults because they may not be able to drive um, or they shouldn't be driving or they have no one to get them to their appointments. So being able to go to them makes their life so much easier. And then that leads into the point that this is where we should be seeing clients anyways, in their natural environment. We can work on functional mobility, functional transfers, ADLs, everything in and outside and around their house, um, doing the things that they do every day versus coming into a gym where they're put on a UBE, put on a new step or, you know, whatever. Um, yeah, and maybe there are situations that are better in a clinic, but we can do most anything in the home um, and they're going to improve and be able to live to their best abilities in their home. Um, there's also minimal overhead to run this type of practice. I remember um, the first year after my business when we were meeting with the accountant and she was she couldn't believe how well my business did because she she was saying that you know it usually takes at least three years for new businesses you know to start having you know some decent income coming in but there's not that much for expense when starting this type of practice, if you're wise about it, of course. Um, and then many big healthcare systems are not going to mess with this market due to Medicare reimbursement rates, drive time and mileage. Now, I know Fox Rehab is a big one that does this, but I just wanna explain a little bit about this. So say I was trying to get our hospital healthcare system to do this type of practice many years ago. I actually started several clinics and assisted livings and memory care facilities throughout our area. Um, but we, I also encourage them, can we go to people's homes and, and do this? So Medicare reimbursement, um, we figure that, we just tell our therapists and our programs and people that are doing this type of practice for now with Medicare, just figure about $100 per an hour session. Well, with a big healthcare system, if they're sending out a therapist from their hospital system, they have to pay for that therapist drive time, their mileage um, to and from, and they obviously want to keep a chunk of it. So we're not seeing as many of them doing this type of practice versus when we can do it ourselves, we get rid of, you know, kind of the middleman, I guess, to say. Um, Sue and Rachel, anything else to add on these topics that you've seen? Yeah, yeah I think um, there's those overhead costs, but also for them, it's, it's um, one more fiddly thing that doesn't keep up with the productivity stuff. Um, and it's really, um, they don't see it as necessary as necessary because they're like, oh, well, we have the home health division and those kinds of pieces, but it really isn't covering the patient needs. Right. And also, yeah, go ahead, Rachel. I was just going to reiterate some of the points you've already made, Kara, which are, you know, when I, when I think about my clients, of course, I'm focusing on dementia. People with dementia, they're going to function better in their natural, comfortable environment. So having them come to a clinic really wouldn't be a great representation of how that individual functions on a day-to-day -day basis. So being able to see them in their home where they're comfortable, um, seeing their environment tells us a lot about their dementia-related behaviors. Um, so I really feel like the home is, is the absolute best place to be, you know, treating that population. Um, and then also to reiterate what you've said, which is a lot of people, they might transition to a memory care or assisted living, and then realize that that environment maybe isn't meeting their needs. So we do a lot of transitioning back to the home and supporting the family um, with, with kind of training for, you know, 
how can you support them with that individual approach a little bit better than maybe a facility could? Yeah, that's, and that's such a great point, Rachel. I'm glad you said that. I mean, really that your services, I mean, the best, absolute best place is in the home. I mean, bringing someone in with dementia to a clinic makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. So yeah, excellent point. And we have a question, um, Karen asks, what do you say to people who say they should tap into Med A, home health care first versus your services Med B? I want people to use Medicare Part A. Um, I, I really talk about the healthcare system and how things work. So when someone's admitted to the hospital and then they are discharged, you know, where, where are they usually discharged? You know, either home with home health to a rehab, maybe to a skilled nursing facility or so forth. So we're following that cycle of care. So if someone is in the hospital and then say they go on um, home health part A, then after home health part A, what's the next step? they're supposed to transition to outpatient. They're not supposed to be in home health forever. They're supposed to transition to outpatient, but we know that our client population isn't the best candidates to come into an outpatient clinic. Now, I, it is nice because they can get that social interaction and that social piece in some of these outpatient clinics, you know, and we can talk about that. But we really talk about the cycle after home health part A, then we can transition you to med B and we can see you in the home or, you know, there's outpatient clinics or so forth. So, and I actually contract with two different home health part A companies and we see their home health part A clients. Um, but if I get a referral for a med B and I feel they should, they should have qualified for med A, I want them to get that benefit. It's whatever is best for your client. And how do you compete with Fox? you're providing better quality care um, and really getting out there and working with um, your clients and developing that relationship with your clients. We've actually had quite a few people in our therapy business builder program that had worked for Fox and um, started their own practice um, as well. And I'm not an expert in Fox by any means, um, but it sounds like they really push that wellness approach after um, they discharge from outpatient part B. And if you guys, if any of you guys work for Fox and want to share further information about that, you sure can. But there's even more reasons why, you know, this is a perfect fit for us. Um, I can't get over the productivity requirements that I see people posting out there. Um, you know, they're like, 100% productivity, 90% productivity. Someone said they're 110% productivity. I mean, that's that's bull crap. Um, and, you know, it's about quality of care, working with the clients, being able to have a life yourself, not, you know, going from one client to the other, to the other, to the other. Um, therapists doing documentation on their own time versus getting paid. I see that a lot out there. And again, documentation is a part of your job. You should be getting paid for it. Um, and, you know, I know some situations it's a bundled payment, like you're contracted and you get paid for a visit and so forth. Um, we even do some of that in my business. Um, being told when and how to treat your clients. I mean, who gets frustrated with that? Oh, you can only see them one time a week for two weeks. Um, minimal visits allowed in your home health agency. I see that. Um, and it's really weird because each of the home health agencies I contract with are completely different, um, but they really kind of guide the show instead of the therapist actually, you know, doing what is best. Um, you know, do you need to work eight to five, Monday through Friday, holidays, weekends, so forth? I remember being in the nursing home and having to work on Christmas. I'm like, seriously? why am I working on Christmas? The patients, clients don't need to be doing therapy on Christmas. This is ridiculous. It's all about the money. Um, so when you do this program or business, you can set up um, your hours the way that works for you. Um, seeing five, seeing over five clients a day. Um, so there's some therapists that are out there in home health seeing 10 clients a day. I do not know how the heck you guys do it. Um, like five clients is about my max per day. Um, there's pay cuts, there's cuts in hours, people are missing their kids and family events, um, they're missing out on life, and 
there's poor quality of care that is being provided. Um, so if you have the initiative and if you have the skills, you know, this is a perfect model for you um, to be able to start your own practice. And it's again, a growing area of need out there. Um, Cindy, have you had to, you know, I, um, I really haven't had to deal with um, any denials or difficulties with my Mac. Um, you know, you got, I mean, you got a lot of the problems that we have with denials and, and big issues over the year, years are people that are fraudulent, that are seeing clients, billing clients, doing things that are outside what they should be doing and going beyond what is skilled and medically necessary. Um, you know, I remember when I worked PRN way back in the day for this lady, and she's like, you have to see everyone for one hour and bill this many units and da 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 da. Um, and I'm like, and if I didn't, I would get in trouble. But then I realized that she was billing for that, but she wasn't seeing the clients for that. You know, so even though we think us as healthcare professionals are, you know, awesome, honest, ethical. Unfortunately, there's some out there that are not. And then I think that kind of wrecks havoc on the system leading to, you know, reviews and so forth. Anything else you guys, Sue and Rachel want to add before we move on? Or if you guys have any issues with the denials or things like that? I've not had denials. In fact, I found my Mac really helpful when I had questions, when I was trying to find answers to is what I'm doing in my practice appropriate. They were really supportive and helpful for me. Um, so that was really nice um, that I found. And I haven't had denials from Medicare except if I goof up and enter the patient's name incorrectly or the wrong Medicare ID, or forget the geo, or the pin I modifier. That's really the piece. Um, and so that's it. Um, Kara, there's a couple of other questions, and I think I will go ahead and answer one or two of those. And Perfect. There's one of the question that says, so can you see a patient for therapy med care B as a home-based therapy when there are concurrent nursing going as an ongoing service, but no therapy services? how to navigate Medicare guidelines, continuum of care and turf issues. So if there's an open Medicare um, part A, then we can't see them for part B. And that part A can be open for wound care, nursing issues, that kind of piece. So I usually make it clear to the doctor, the family, um, if they open that, like I've had clients that I've been seeing for home modifications and have been working with them, um, and then they've developed some skin breakdown as we're in the process of getting stuff. So just let the doctor know while the home health nurse is in there looking at skin stuff or wound care, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to be out. Um, but if the family have funds, it, they can private pay you um, in that situation but you still are required to bill Medicare with the modifier on it and you will get denied. Um, but that's the piece that you need to be aware of. But the um, ABN and stuff needs to be in advance. You can't post date it and um, do that. So that's just one of the tricky things of being aware there. I think as Kara alluded to, working with your home care, home health agencies in the area is um, the helpful approach to take um, and working together as a team. And someone asked about um, when you're doing your practice or are you doing your practice without referrals or are the doctor signing off on your plan of care? So you need to know your state practice act if you need um, a doctor's referral or not. Um, with Medicare Part B um, in the regulations, you do not need a referral. However, the doctor has to sign off on the plan of care within 30 days. So we really recommend getting the referrals because you wanna make sure that the doctor's gonna sign off on your plan of care. And we have seen this happen where 
therapist did not get a referral. They started seeing a client. They sent the plan of care to this client's doctor and the doctor's like, I'm not signing off on this. Um, so you do not want to get yourself um, in that situation. Yeah, I always reach out and speak to their MA at least and say, hey, this is what's going on. Is this going to be okay? I'm going to send some stuff over. What do you think? This is how I got to be involved. Um, I've never had anyone turn me down when I take that approach. Um, so that's been really helpful. And I mean, and to be honest, I mean, I tell therapists in our programs that there are plenty of times I don't worry about getting a referral because I have that good relationship with the provider already. Um, and I know that they're going to sign off on our plan of care and, and it's okay for my state. Um, but if it was a new provider, a new client or whatever, I would hundred percent get that referral. Um, and we just recommend getting the referral because the more you call that office and talk to the nurse and so forth, um, the more you're going, they're going to know you and um, start reaching out to you to provide their therapy services. Okay, great questions. Keep them coming. Um, so next is what is a mobile hybrid practice and why is this type of practice needed when working with older adults? So I will tell you when I was starting my practice, I was going to be cash-based private pay because that's how all the cool kids did it, right? You see everyone on Facebook um, and trust me, don't believe anything you see on Facebook half the time. Oh my goodness. Um, but you see everyone on Facebook talking about private practice, cash base, and how, you know, you can do this with anyone and everyone. And I have a hundred percent stance that not for older adults. Um, if you want to do a private cash pay practice, maybe focus on a different population or yeah, there are ways around it, but it's just not what I believe in. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about why. And Sue, I know, was in the same boat as me um, going to start a private cash-based practice um, as well. Yeah, I thought that's what I was going to do. And then um, I was sharing a big office building. We had separate offices at the chiropractor. I was talking to the chiropractor's front desk. She's like, oh, you can't do that. <laughs> and then we read the rules and realized, oh, I can't do that um, and what it looks like. But frankly, in my area that I work in, it's the perfect kind of market and um, combination area. And I think, Rachel, you find that too, right, with a lot of what you're doing. Absolutely. And I actually initially thought I did know kind of the, the rules and regulations around Medicare billing, but for a little while, I thought I would just offer a consultation service to caregivers and do private pay and just that. Um, and then the more I thought about it, you know, why would I not integrate this caregiver training into my patient's plan of care and get it covered through insurance? It just it didn't seem to make sense for those clients or for myself. Um, so I ended up going with Medicare. Definitely similar type of situation for all of us. So let's talk a little bit about what is a hybrid practice. So instead of just being cash-based or all insurance, you know, a hybrid practice combines, you know, a variety of things. You're offering private pay, cash, insurance, you know, and maybe you're doing some mobile versus clinic versus telehealth and so forth. So you're taking the hybrid approach. So with my practice, you know, I see a client in a skilled nursing facility that's private pay. They pay me privately to come into them. I see, I contract with, um, OT, or I contract with home health care agencies, two of them. So I contract with them and get paid a set amount per visits and so forth. I bill Medicare Part B. I bill some insurances out of network. I'm now in network with quite a few other insurances, um, but I have a wide variety of approach. I'm not just cash. I'm not just, you know, insurances with that. Um, and then a little bit about why I feel so strongly in this um, position is for services that are skilled and medically necessary, therapists need to bill Medicare Part B. PT and OT and private practice cannot opt out of Medicare. If you look in the Medicare 
Benefit Policy Manual, Chapter 15, it talks about how we cannot opt out of Medicare. And then you need to know the Medicare mandatory claim submission rules um, where we need to complete and submit a claim. And there's some good resources below. One, read the Medicare manual um, and learn more about it. Um, two, these are some good uh, articles on here from attorneys um, that talk about it. Because again, I mean, it's a huge issue. I don't know if issues the word or hot topic out there between the cash, med B and so forth. Um, but the other thing is, Older adults want to use their Medicare benefits. Um, I hear these people saying, oh, they have Medicare, but they would rather pay me private pay. I mean, honestly, there is not one single client that I have ever heard that from. I mean, they want to use their they want to use their insurance um, benefits. And of course, I do live in rural North Dakota. Um, we're not a, you know, really wealthy area where people can pay private pay, but still they've been paying in um, to this for how long they want to be able to utilize um, their Medicare benefits. And it's not that difficult um, for us to be able to, to do this. So Rachel and Sue, anything you guys want to add on hybrid practice and why we really need to be doing this if you're working with older adults? Exactly what you said, Kara. I mean, I think so many people, I hear the same thing, you know, even I think in, I just had a conversation with an OT last week who said, oh, well, there's a PT in the home and they're getting paid privately. I'm like, there's, <laughs> there's really no reason that that should be happening for a few reasons. You know, one, again, the, the rules, but two, if that patient has been paying into the Medicare system, you know, or, or they have this benefit, why would we not um, tap into that for them so that they could use that money to pay for other services, especially, you know, in, again, in my line of work, we talk a lot about the need for respite, the need for non-medical home care. Um, if they have a little bit of extra funds, then I would rather see that go to bringing in non-medical home care, um, and allowing me as the skilled professional to go through insurance and, and support them in that way. Um, yeah, that's just, my that's an amazing point. Yeah, because in my area, you know, we're focusing on um, DME and home modifications. I mean, I, I as well as part of it. But again, a lot of those, if they just have straight Medicare, aren't covered. And having to be careful with the resources that they have a chronic illness um, is there. And they've paid premiums and they want to see some results for that. Having said that, I do have some clients that have more, you know, more affluent. Um, and again, you know, they're the ones that are able to get the more extensive home modifications and those, but they're still very careful with their resources. And so that's that. Um, as we go along with a couple of the questions that have come up, there's two. Um, one says, as an OT, we still can't initiate services, correct? Does PT and nursing still have to go in first? And so that's a rule with home health, which is actually being changed under the public health emergency, but it doesn't apply to Part B services so that um, we can definitely see the patient as an outpatient without them seeing any other services at all. Um, it's not dependent. And of course, you know, we talk about the cap. Well, there's no longer a cap there is a soft threshold and then a harder kind of threshold where we have to do some things with coding and we have to look at medical necessity a little more closely. But OT is a whole separate bundle related to that. And so it's kind of amazing to be able to do that. Um, what I find is that a lot of physicians and clients don't understand that, nor do other healthcare providers. So I spend a lot of time explaining to the physician this is not home health. This is outpatient part B, but under the Medicare regulations as a therapist in private practice, the two places that I can see a client are in my office or in their home. And those are still both considered appropriate places. And as an OTE particularly, the home again is the most amazing place to see a client. Um, 
in terms of the true occupation, the true environmental context, things that you never fully get when you're seeing them in a clinic um, that allows you to provide much more client-centered and effective therapy. Um, does anyone else want to answer that piece before I bring up the change? Well, I just like to, I, I do want to add it. It is very important that what we are talking about is not home health. We're not talking about home health part A. And that's, this is one of the biggest barriers that, you know, this type of practice has out there because um, outpatient therapy in the home, you know, people think we're home health and we, I just constantly am educating people. We, I am an outpatient clinic. I bring my outpatient clinic to the client's home. In fact, last week I was arguing with an insurance company back and forth. She's like, you're home health. I'm like, no, I'm not home health. She's like, well, you see clients in the home. I'm like, I'm still not home health. I'm outpatient and <laughs> so forth and, and go back and forth with that. Yeah, that's true. Um, and it's, it's interesting because we're educating other providers as well as the clients. And, and often it gets into a conflict a little bit because they don't understand. And so having to explain them is one thing. Um, I do often provide some written materials that help explain that. Um, I'm, I'm gonna just answer the other question that Kathleen had in there, um, Cara, before I go to the one on home months. Um, it says, uh, can therapists accept just the Medicare payment for services and write off the portion of charges that Medicare does not pay, thus avoiding having to bill patients for the remainder. Do you want to take that or you want me to start? Um, I mean, I very rarely ever have a client that doesn't have a secondary insurance and it's 100% paid for. So Medicare pays 80% and then it gets sent on to their secondary and they pay the 20%. Um, you know, I've had a few clients that have had like a Medicare Advantage plan where I've been out of network with. So in that case, Medicare paid 80%. And since I was out of network, the client paid the 20%, but they were fine um, paying for that. And it depends on the Medicare Advantage plan because there's oh, a lot yeah. of differences with that. Some are just a fixed co-payment, some are a percentage, and if they have out of network or not. But I'm going to get back to that answer. We actually can't write off and just forgive the copayment because it's seen as an inducement to pay the services. And so it's actually illegal. So what you are required to do is to make the same consistent approach across all your clients. You are required to make reasonable efforts to collect the copayment. Um, and so as long as you have the same consistent policy, which for most of us is build them once or twice, I'm not sending them to debt collection, I'm not doing that piece. So that's kind of the piece you have to handle with that. Um, like Cara, um, I'm, a lot of my patients have a Medicare supplement, which is a secondary that covers that, or they are QMB patients, which is Medicare, Medicaid, and Medicaid writes the 20% off for you. So, <laughs> so that's, that's the piece that happens with that. Um, Medicaid just says you can't bill the patient for the rest. And since Medicare reimbursed you more than we would, that's all you're getting. Um, and that takes care of that piece. So any other questions on billing and stuff? Um, we had someone ask about who handles billing. Um, we 100% recommend that our therapists learn everything about the billing process, how to do billing and so forth, because it's really important that you understand everything about your business and how the billing um, occurs. Once you get to the point where you can no longer handle it, like Sue, then you can hire someone to help you with it. Um, and, you know, that's where I have someone that helps me with it now too, but initially um, it's really important you understand that whole process. Um, and then we do have um, a question on the home mods. Do you wanna to touch base on that now? Quick Sue, are home safety modifications a standalone Medicare reversible eval or best in context of comprehensive evaluation treatment? 
and I'm going to say on this, it all depends. <laughs> so um, under the MIPS or the um, Merit-Based in Incentive Payment Program, um, because of the high cost of falls, et cetera, Medicare recognized um, based on the evidence that an OT home safety eval was one of the things that actually we talk about the evidence reduces falls for 42%, by 42%. And it was very specific that it was an OT home safety evaluation. And so that is covered under that thing. And we teach about how to do that and what it looks like. Um, but often when I go in there, I find they're in ill-fitting seating equipment. They need a range of other DME. They haven't had anyone do caregiver training. There's issues related to strengthening. I, you know, one of the clients I just saw today was um, an older gentleman who um, today was actually his one year anniversary of his motorcycle accident, incomplete C2 to C4 quad that was sent home with no OT follow-up, like absolutely no OT follow-up. And so when I picked him up looking at the home mod stuff, we picked him up for a comprehensive program, right? So there's, it, there's both. And some clients I see, I'm going in, you know, I have a gentleman with ALS and we're just going in to look at doing the home mods at this stage because that's really all they need. They've got the rest and the support in place. But all of those services are fully covered and can be totally reimbursed by Medicare. Awesome. Okay, I'll keep us moving. So specialty areas you can focus on in this type of practice. So I just wanted to kind of highlight this. You don't have to have a specialty area. You know, we do talk about having a niche and so forth. But for myself, I just provide general, we provide general therapy services. We do OT and PT. Um, and we do home mods, we do the skills to care program, um, falls prevention, all that kind of stuff. But you can really niche down and focus on different areas. And these are just a few highlights. So dementia and Rachel is, you know, a perfect example how that's her business. Um, you know, you can really focus on falls prevention. Um, Sue does tons in the home modification and accessibility area. Lymphedema and wounds is a huge um, need out there. Um, I mean, it's still, I don't know how many years I've been lymphedema certified and still edema is not being managed at all. It's, it's crazy. Um, so, you know, people do the driving um, eval, whoops. Um, Goof typo there, Mar um, Parkinson's specialty mobile practice. So, you know, there's therapists that get certified and just focus on um, clients with Parkinson's. I love my Parkinson's wellness recovery certifications. Some people just do neuro practices, um, mobile clinics. Some just focus on caregiver education and training. Some just focus on orthopedic. Um, just think of those um, older adults that have surgeries and come home and they can't get into an outpatient clinic or anything. So the pre and post-op clients um, are all great examples of different areas that you could niche down in. Carol, I'm just going to let you know that next week, Wednesday, we're doing a home mods um, training and we are going to be highlighting all of the different evidence that supports um, occupational therapists in that training. There's, there's quite a bit of it out there. Um, so just curious for you guys in here that are considering or have a mobile practice, do you want to have a specific area? If so, put that area or if you just want to be more general, you know, put that in the comment section below so we can kind of see what you guys are all thinking. Awesome. So a mix. Great. And Rachel, you actually, um, one of your friends does neuro, right? A PT? I actually, yeah, I have a uh, friend of mine locally who is a PT who specializes in neuro rehabilitation. She employs um, 
speech, OT, and PT, but they focus on, they have a, you know, a very heavy Parkinson's population, but they also work with clients with dementia, ALS, brain injury, MS, stroke. Um, so a very heavy neuro, neuro population. And, and my PhD research, um, I published things like the Cochrane Systematic Review and Sensory Impairment and stuff. So I actually see, um, I've got five stroke patients on caseload right now. Um, and as we get post the COVID, I'm also thinking about adding, you know, a gym for them and some other things to my clinic. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of things you can do with combination like that. And I see a lot of people talking about, can you combine things like home mods and dementia? Perfect combination. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly right, Rachel. I mean, yes, perfect, perfect combination. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, Jennifer mentioned incontinence, and this is a huge area too. Um, about every one of my clients could really benefit from like a pelvic floor therapist that focuses on incontinence and so forth. It's it, that's a huge area with older adults. Um, ooh, awesome! Congratulations on getting your lymphedema certification. Great, um, great. Um, for a mobile practice, I've even had a wound doctor was like, this is great because you can see them more often because like home health or everywhere else that, you know, they're not able um, to do that or see them as much. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about the age friendly therapy clinic and why this is important for your therapy clinic or mobile practice as you get up and going or if you um, decide to start your mobile practice. So um, my business is Home Therapy Solutions, and we are um, a participant in the age-friendly healthcare system. And I strongly believe that um, therapists that have a mobile hybrid practice working with older adults should also um, become an age-friendly healthcare system. And it just fits perfectly with you know, our beliefs and what we do. So I wanted to share a little bit about this program. So it's an initiative of the John Hartford Foundation and the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. And it's also in partnership with the American Hospital Association and the Catholic Health Association of the United States. And their goal is to spread this framework across the United States to all healthcare facilities, clinics, um, that work with older adults, and it's even worldwide. It's not just in the United States either. But their, you know, their big goal is to improve evidence-based practice for every older adult. And I mean, I could talk for hours just on the age-friendly system, but it's guided by the four M's. So I just want to talk a little bit about the four M's because it fits perfectly with my occupational therapy practice. We have to cover these four M's. The first one is what matters. So we need to make sure that what we're doing is focused on what matters to the client. So client-centered, right? That's what we need to be doing. So we need to be documenting that. Um, in our documentation and making sure we're addressing what matters to the client. Um, medication. So obviously, you know, we're not medication prescribers or anything like that, but there are things that we can and should address with medication. Um, one thing that we do is we educate on the different medications that older adults need to be aware of and utilize with caution. Um, I really promote medication reconciliations. Um, in fact, one of my clients um, called me tonight because they had a doctor's appointment yesterday and I said, you need to talk to your doctor and do a medication reconciliation. And she said it went great. They, and he immediately changed the medic, you know, changed a couple of medications and went through it all because they're having people prescribe these medications and no one talks, you know, this doctor prescribes this, this doctor prescribes this, that can lead to a, you know, a lot of difficulties. Um, so medications, part of it, mentation. So we need to assess their dementia um, as well as depression and then mobility. So we need to assess their mobility, um, which we do all of these things anyways. Um, also, their goal is to cause no harm and they want um, to spread this across the United States so that 
as healthcare providers working with older adults, it, we're more consistent with what matters and we're trying to catch these things, these problems with medications. These people that are at huge falls risk, but the primary care doctor never, never asked the right questions or you know, does a screen or anything for it. Um, so in our therapy business builder program, we make sure our level one um, people have completed the application process. And then in level two, we go through to the next stage with it. Um, and I honestly had no idea about this program um, until last November. I work with the UN University of North Dakota um, and they have a Dakota geriatrics program and they were the ones that introduced me um, to this program. So, so yeah, I think it's a perfect fit um, for where, what we need to do. So I would definitely recommend you guys check that out. Okay, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about certifications that complement this type of practice. And um, the first thing I want to say, and Rachel and Sue don't kick me for this, is you do not need a certification to start your own practice, okay? You absolutely do not need any other certifications. I'm so tired of hearing therapists say, oh, I need more education or I need to go get these certifications. No, you don't. You don't need certifications to start your own practice. Um, but there are certain certifications that can really help you in your practice and in the care you provide. In fact, I personally recommend starting your practice and once you get out there in your community, you're gonna kind of learn what the needs are. Like one, you know, I didn't get certifications before I started my practice. I started working with clients. I had a huge population of um, clients with Parkinson's. So one of the first certifications I took was um, the Parkinson's Wellness Recovery Program, which I love, and it was great. Um, then I was having so many clients with dementia um, and their caregivers were stressed out and so forth. So then I took the Skills to Care certification, which is huge. Um, so it's important that you don't just go get all these certifications for the fact of getting them, okay? You need to know your population, who you're gonna be working with and use them to supplement and guide your practice. So we're gonna talk about a few certifications, um, but we're primarily gonna talk about the skills to care and the home accessibility and safety therapist training. Um, but before Rachel starts, I am just a, 100% advocate for the skills to care certification training because it's not just a training. They actually give you the steps you need to create your own practice. You know, what you do on this first visit, what you do on the second visit, it's a perfect guide. So if you wanna do dementia, um, you wanna work with caregivers, I 100% recommend this training. So Rachel, take it over and tell us more about the skills to care training. Thank you, Kara. Um, and I usually try to make sure that I tell people to, you know, I, I, of course, have become kind of a spokesperson for skills to care, but I became this because I love the program so much. So I got trained in the program. I used to call myself skills to care's biggest cheerleader. And I started my practice because I loved this program and felt like there was a need in the community. So it wasn't the opposite <laughs> for me. You know, I wasn't someone who was just out there and then, you know, felt like I, I needed to pitch skills to care to people. I just really, really love this program. Um, so skills to care is an evidence-based program that comes from research from Thomas Jefferson University. Um, it used to be called the Environmental Skill Building Program. And the researchers who developed it are Dr. Laura Gitlin and Dr. Kathy Pearsall. Um, I believe Dr. Tracy Vosserland also had a hand in the research as well. Um, so if you know anything about dementia research, uh, those names <laughs> should ring a bell. Um, they also developed, Dr. Gitlin also had her hand in developing um, something called Tailored Activity Program or New Ways for Better Days and COPE. So if you've heard of those programs, you know, Skills to Care comes from this same research. 
So skills to care is actually a certification only for occupational therapists. Um, OT assistants can become certified if they attend training with their supervising occupational therapist. Um, so just keep that in mind if you're interested. Um, there are a couple different parts to training. So there is some kind of you know, on your own <laughs> um, self-paced modules that you'll do beforehand. And then uh, there are two full days of a live Zoom training. That's with me. Um, and we go through um, every single component of the program. So we break down, just like Kara said, we talk through what do you do on session one? What do you do in session two, session three, et cetera. Um, and then after those two live days, by the end of the second live day, you are good to go. You can use skills to care in the community, but we have five or six <laughs> um, coaching calls that we do after that, um, that they are a required part of the, of the program, but really it's meant to support you as you try the program. So we didn't want you to just go out there and think like, oh, how, okay, now I'm out in the field. How do I really use this? How do I adapt it for real life? So the coaching calls are really meant to help support you as you navigate, you know, implementing the program in the real world. Um, the, let's see, what else do I want to say about this? Um, I should say two skills to care is a, I mentioned it was a caregiver training program. So I usually like to make sure people know this is a program about how to work with caregivers. That being said, <laughs> I like to think that, you know, you gain a lot of knowledge about how to work with people with dementia in the process. Um, and I try to make sure I support my OTs as they go through this training process with learning different skills needed for working with individuals with dementia. But if you're someone who already has a wealth of knowledge in dementia care, um, it doesn't mean that skills to care is off the table. We actually had someone join us um, in the in the last group in April who is, you know, she has a very advanced amount of knowledge in dementia care, but she felt like skills to care was a great way to provide some structure to her practice and then allow her to, when she hires um, additional occupational therapists, knowing that if they get certified, they're all implementing um, their care in the same, with the same structure. So I do think that this could benefit OTs who are either new starting out, I use this program as a new grad and I really liked the structure for that. Um, but also if you have that knowledge, I still think that there, there could be a benefit for you as well. Um, our next training dates are July 16th and 23rd. Um, Kara has the Dementia Collaborative website up there that has more details about exactly when the dates are and what's involved in training. So you can feel free to peruse and learn more, but make sure you sign up through Next Level for your discount. Um, and then we also have a training coming up in October as well. That's October 15th and 22nd. Uh, registration does close two weeks beforehand. Um, I want to give you enough time to actually do your online modules. And then um, I'm going to trial something new this round and mail out some hard copies of some training materials to everyone. So I need enough time to do that too. Um, yeah, I think those are, are, are the big points. Does anyone have questions about skills to care, the certification process, using the program? We also, I know we have Karen Russell here too. Karen's been doing skills to care, I think longer than I have. So thank you, Karen, for joining us. Um, um, there is one question in the chat there, Rachel. Um, yeah. so does caregivers include training CNAs in a long-term care setting? Great question. So um, we definitely can train formal and informal caregivers, meaning family members or paid caregivers. Um, the, the training itself was developed in research more for family caregivers. So the, the program is geared towards informal caregivers, friends, family, that type of thing. However, I will say I've used this program with formal or paid caregivers fairly regularly with success. I think that um, training CNAs in a long-term care setting, I do think that there's some potential and benefit for using skills to care in that setting, but skills to care would require some modification to make that work only because CNAs in long-term care likely don't have the 
the time <laughs> necessary to fully participate in every single session. So we need to modify it or tweak it a bit, but we have OTs doing that. So I definitely think it's possible. Um, and sorry, I pulled up the chat. So thank you, Kara. Yes, recertification is $200 every two years um, and just requires that you, you send in um, one case report. So I know that, you know, you still know what you're doing, but that's it. Um, and yeah, any. I would just like to chime in. So here in North Dakota, um, there's another therapist that has a mobile practice, um, just like myself. She was one of our therapy business builder um, members. And so her and I work closely with our Alzheimer's Association. And um, she's to the point where she's almost only going to see clients with the skills to care program and have all of the other OTs and PTs in her practice um, see the other clients. But our Alzheimer's Association loves this program. And so we work together with um, their, you know, depending on the different areas of the state with one of their leads, we work together with clients. So um, they refer to us for the skills to care program. Then we obviously refer to them for their services and work together. Um, it's just a wonderful program. Even, I just think the assessment itself is worth it. They have this great assessment. Um, it can take you a while to complete, especially yeah. myself. Yeah. <laughs> um, the assessment is really good because it really gives you a deep dive into what's going on. And then, you know, the action plans and what to do. I mean, it, it's a really great program. So, and um, everyone in the next level group, Rachel's been gracious that we um, have been able to work um, collaboratively together. And um, we offer a discount for um, the Skills to Care program in our next level program. You guys on here tonight, um, you'll get an email later for a little extra special discount than what we normally provide just for our next level members. But those in our Therapy Business Builder program get um, a lot larger um, discount just because I 100% believe that the doing like our therapy business builder and the skills to care program can really help build a strong business for people. As far as the um, CDP certification providing dementia care. So um, Rachel will be able to add more to this, but I just wanted to say, so um, Mike Chua is another, um, I'm a huge fan of Mike and his programs and his certifications that he does, but it's really more education on um, dementia in a whole, like the skills to care is a legit business in a box a program, right? Right. Whole <laughs> program. Right. Um, so it's really not comparable to that. I. And I, I didn't mention this, um, but probably an important point for OTs out there. So um, it is approved for uh, 30 continuing education hours through AOTA. Um, so if you do that here, you're pretty much good to go for your, uh, for your certification period for those contact hours. I realize that it is a hefty program and there's a cost involved. I know it's not for everyone, so there's no pressure from my end, but I wouldn't do this if I didn't really feel very strongly about the benefits. Um, even, I think it was yesterday, somebody who the, the person <laughs> who runs a practice sent one of her OTs to come to skills to care training in April. Um, and so I wasn't sure how she would feel because she wasn't the one to actually attend the program. Um, so I was hoping that she would, you know, be happy with what her, her OT came back with. And she sent me an email saying how appreciative she is and how life-changing this program is and how she can't wait to send more OTs through the skills to care program moving forward. Um, so I really do think that it can be really valuable and really life-changing for caregivers um, for and for our clients with dementia. I also had, I had a client one time, I always tell this story, but I brought two students with me. This is going back probably two years ago um, with permission to see a family for skills to care. And the caregiver the daughter was crying and I thought it was something related to, you know, the emotional 
toll of caregiving. And she told me that she was just so happy that uh, students were learning how to do this program because I do think that there's such a need in our community for this type of support. Caregivers don't often know that they can access services and get care that's also covered. Um, so I do think it's it's it can be really valuable and really helpful for those of you who who think it's uh, a good fit for you and for your practice. And Rachel, um, I posted a question in the chat. Um, someone's asking kind of about how has the Allen cognitive disability model influenced skills to care and how do you frame that model in evals and treatments? That's a great question too. So I, we do not require that you use the Allens as part of skills to care because again, skills to care as a standalone program is a caregiver program. So it could be skills to care could be offered as a consultation service to just the caregiver without any patient involvement. But the beauty of Med B and, and what we're all here to do is that we can take that program and integrate it into our patient's plan of care to show how using this program and training the caregiver can benefit our patient. So when I integrate skills to care into my patient's plan of care, which is what I do with pretty much everybody, I love <laughs> the combination of skills to care and the Allens. Um, I feel like the two mesh perfectly together and understanding our patient's functional cognition um, provides us with so much information that we can then use to educate the caregiver. Um, and and I, I think it just it enhances the skills to care program. Um, and I realized I didn't touch on the, the comment about becoming a certified dementia practitioner. Um, I think Kara made a great point about this that, you know, they really um, aren't, they aren't the same in that certified dementia practitioner focuses more on uh, strategies to work with the person with dementia and skills to care is really about implementing a full evidence-based program for the caregiver. Um, but I will say that I can't promise that this will be the case forever or that it will work with everyone. I actually became grandfathered, um, into the, the certified dementia practitioner. Uh, I got that as a, through a grandfather program because of my skills to care certification. So I actually, you know, wrote up information for them about what all is involved in skills to care training and they, um, and paid, you know, their fee. And then they said, yep, this is, this qualifies you for becoming a certified dementia practitioner. So I hope that helps answer some of those questions. One more about a COTA, um, if I am a COTA and I contract with an OT for eval, does that OT have to take the skills to care training in order for me to use the program? Yes. Um, I, I don't know if that will ever change in the future, but excuse me, as of right now, uh, an occupational therapist or an OTR would have to attend with a COTA. Um, Again, you know, the, the program is still designed and, and there's oversight by Thomas Jefferson University. So there's potential that that may change at some point. But um, as far as I know, they, they plan on COTAs can attend training as long as there's an OTR to attend with them. I hope that helps. Awesome. Okay. Thank you, Rachel. So you. Um, and any other questions, let us know. But again, Next level people, you get special discounts through us. So you wanna make sure you register um, through our link and then I get you connected with Rachel. Um, so the next I'm gonna have Sue talk about, and this is a brand new program. We haven't released it. We haven't, I mean, some people know just through kind of the grapevine a little bit, um, but Sue has been working very hard for the last several months um, we decided that we needed to create a certification program for home accessibility and safety that is specifically for occupational therapists. Um, and again, if you look at the research, it really supports occupational therapists doing this. And so many of the trainings out there, which we have taken, um, are for not just therapists, but you know anyone out there. So we have taken everything that we feel is needed um, and put it into one massive certification program. Um, 
And the next week, Wednesday, during our home mods webinar is when we will start finally accepting people into the program. But we thought we'd give you guys a little glimpse into um, the program today. So I'll let Sue um, talk. Um, yeah, so I think the key thing we discovered was when you do the other certifications, they give you a general overview of home mods. They give you kind of some perspectives of it, but it's usually from a very different perspective than we as an OT need. Um, particularly when we're looking at geriatric clients and we're looking at clients who are Medicare beneficiaries, um, there are certain skills and things that we need to know that are very specific and not covered in those certifications and those programs. And Cara and I have pretty much done a range of them so that we can kind of know um, what's in there. And I don't know, Cara, if you want to kind of slide down on that area. But what we figured is we really, really needed something that was going to help us understand the occupational therapy perspective, what it looks like, how to, um, to write your notes, your documentation, your billing, what to do when you go to a session, how that goes, what are some tools that help you do that well, um, what kind of modifications work well for clients, things like what do you, what can you bill Medicare or other insurances for, what is cash, oh great Cara, thanks, yes, so some of the things in here we look at in the first one, understanding the impact of falls, it gives you a good basis for doing the occupation, looks at therapy um, perspectives and theories, looking at how Medicare Part B interacts, um, looking at ethics, because ethic is a big deal in this area, um, particularly since you're working with construction people and you know, they're expecting a 10% referral fee. What does that look like? You know, how do we do that in practice? Selling equipment. What are the ethics of doing that? AOTA has very clear ethical guidelines um, related to those things and how that impacts our judgment when we're working with clients as a therapist. We go through what that looks like. Um, learning the nuts and bolts. Things like learning to read a floor plan. Um, looking at home modifications, looking at getting your systems, what kinds of tools, what things do you take with you when you first go, um, what assessments can you use, what client factors do you need to consider, looking at basics of ramp design, basics of bathroom modifications, um, some products to use, those kinds of things. Um, the next module looks at, yeah, exactly, what are you going to do and get ready before your first visit, your first visit. How do you tell if this is someone that you need to bill Medicare for or not? And how do you make that decision tree? What do you do in your first visit after? Can you use telehealth? Um, writing a, a letter of medical necessity, a report and a scope of work. Um, using Magic Plan, which we have a template for. Um, home for Life Design. What, um, how do you get it funded? What does that look like? Um, funding DMEs and letters of medical necessity. And then we look at ones that looking at um, specific populations. Uh, what can you do with low vision? Um, we have a video where we work with a low vision specialist out of Oregon Health Science University, uh, KCI Institute. We look at dementia, spinal cord injury, stroke, um, mental health, what if it's a rental property, what are some of the pros and cons and rules that apply, um, disaster and emergency planning. And I think the next one is, what are the cash base um, options? So working in the aging in place market, working with contractors, working with realtors, um, the senior home safety specialist program, uh, some roles for the OTA, working with nonprofits, which some of us have done, um, key components of accessible design and um, product selection and some pieces on project management. So looking at an overall comprehensive course that's looking at how you as a therapist can work in this environment, understand the construction industry, understand the um, insurance and some of the coverage areas and being able to get up and get running really quickly without um, 
the huge learning curve and some of the mistakes that uh, we all made in the process of learning that. So any questions related to that? Kara, you're muted. And if you guys are interested in specifically home modifications, I'd encourage you to um, join us next week when we kind of dig deep into, you know, why um, occupational therapists are and COTAs are really well suited for home mods and accessibility and digging into the evidence and, and going into this a little bit more. So if you have questions, write them in the chat. Um, other Things, um, it will be, um, um, PASS will be opening up next Wednesday. So other certifications out there. So dementia care specialist training. So Mike Chua does a training um, and he offers um, training to all of, um, he offers um, training and I'll talk a little bit more about it, but he offers again, discounts to people in the next level program as well. Um, Senior Home Safety Specialist, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about in a little bit. Um, our Home Mods program, the cost and length, we'll talk about that next week when we reveal how people can sign up for it. Um, certified Aging in Place Professional, CAPS, you might hear about that. Um, those in our um, next level programs get special um, discounts on that, depending on what kind of program you're in. There's a Certified Living in Place Specialist, Executive Certificate in Home Modification, Parkinson's Wellness Recovery Program, Big and Loud, Lymphedema Certifications, and I'm sure there are, are a lot more, but these are ones that I hear a lot about. Um, and of course, if you're doing dementia care and working with caregivers, I'm greatly biased. I 100% recommend Skills to Care. Obviously, I'm biased to the HAS certification. Um, I absolutely love the Parkinson's Wellness Recovery Program. Before Skills to Care, that was my favorite certification program. I utilize it with all of my clients, not just with um, clients with Parkinson's. Um, I personally prefer it over Big and Loud. Um, my PT is um, trained in Big and Loud, but I know people are biased to that one. Or I mean, there's reasons for either or, but um, love that program. So I would definitely check that out as well. Um, Yes, so I will send out, you guys will get emails and with the link to the discount and so forth for the Skills to Care program as well. Oh no. Okay, where are we at? Since I accidentally clicked the wrong way, I see. Okay, so a lot of people wanna know how much money can you make in this type of practice? So. This is going to be very simplistic. I mean, we go over way more details of this in other trainings and so forth, but I just want you to think about the numbers at least, okay? So if you build your practice to five clients per day, which is 25 clients per week, so that's 100 clients per month, so 1,200 clients per year, and if you get $100 per one hour visit, that's $120,000. Now, you guys aren't gonna have five clients per day when you start. Um, I, I don't even wanna see 25 clients per week personally. So um, I, I try to only see clients two days a week. Um, and then I hire, um, I have other therapists that see clients. So then I have other therapists see clients. So then I make money off of them seeing clients and so forth. So there's different ways to make um, money when you're doing this. And a hundred dollars is, you know, on the lower end, um, you know, cause when I say like my Medicare payments are, you know, like 112, 14, 18, 19, dollars per visit evals are higher but like some of my other insurances are you know 200 plus dollars an hour um private pay you can you know mark that higher so i feel this is a lower ballpark end um but i also don't want people to think that you know you're going to start this practice and you're going to easily make this you know right away 
it does take work and you have to be committed um, to get out there and really um, put in the work and effort. And yeah, Medicare fees do vary and it depends on what you bill. So different CPT codes get reimbursed at different rates. So just to make it easy, we kind of just average the $100 and the $100 we're thinking the 80 and 20% combined. Um, but again, I'd say it's still a little bit on the lower end, but I'm just saying, you know, if Medicare has more cuts or whatever, we can think about that. Um, so the yearly expenses, like 5,000, I feel is high. Um, and actually in our business expense flow chart, flow chart, it's way, way lower than this, but um, it depends on the services you use and so forth. But you have your EMR, billing, fax, liability, insurance, you know, I mean, there's really not much you need um, to function and do um, to do this business. So you don't have the cost of a clinic. Now, some people do have an office that they rent and so forth. Um, my office is my home, um, so I don't have to worry about that. The other thing is that I love about having a business is all of the deductions. So, um, you know, I go to continuing education where I also take my family on vacations um, and, you know, I mean, you have to know what you can and cannot deduct, but there's lots of great um, deductions out there. So, um, so this just gives you a ballpark. We dig a lot more into it in, in some of our other trainings, but a lot of people want to know like how much, but I guess when I first started um, my own practice, you know, I'd go see three clients or two clients and I am like, sweet. I uh, made more in seeing two clients than I did all day at a skilled nursing facility. Um, so that's just how big of cut everyone else takes out of it um, when you remove them and you get payment directly from Medicare or the insurance company. Um, so how to get started. So we're going to kind of do a brief overview of how to get started. Um, we have some great resources for you guys um, as well, if you haven't already checked them out. Um, so on our website, we have like a startup checklist, um, business plan and things like that. But we're going into two years now of um, our therapy business builder program. And um, I'd say since we started, we have every single time we've rolled out our program, we've you know made changes to improve and better serve our clients. Um, and we actually rolled out our new program um, in April. We didn't publicly announce this and I haven't pushed it out there, but we've had actually quite a few people start um, with this program already. And I'd say it's Definitely um, the changes that we made, I'm super happy about. So I want to share that with you. And in the same time, you'll learn what you need to do when you start your business. So um, also, I we used to you know help everyone start their business. I no longer do that. Um, if you're working with me, you're gonna, it's because you want to have you know the best quality hybrid mobile practice for older adults. I know I'm not gonna help pediatric women's health you know, things like that out there. Um, if you're specifically doing home mods and so forth, then you'll be um, connected and aligned with Sue, um, depending on where you're at in our program and so forth. Um, so this is um, on our website. I'll just put a link here that you guys can um, check through. But I just want to talk a little bit about um, our program. And so we we have a team of therapists. It's definitely, I'm just a really small part of the piece, but um, you know, Sue is a valuable component to our program. Tony Maritato is a valuable component of our program. Steve Gluck, he's the CEO of Hello Note, is a valuable part of our program, as well as all of the clinicians that have started and built their business are a wealth of knowledge. So you have a community um, to support you. And I think that was you know, that was a really tough time when I started my business. One, I made so many costly errors because I trusted what people told me on Facebook. Um, and 
you know, I lost lots of money doing that and not knowing the right thing. Um, and then just having a support system of people to ask questions to, because some things are confusing. Um, also, people don't realize that, you know, we need to follow some rules. You know, you should have a policy and procedure manual. You should have a Medicare compliance plan. Um, and you see out there that lots of people just get started and they're not really doing it the correct way. Um, so that's why we really decided we're taking a shift and we're only focusing on those therapists that want to build practices like all of us have um, in the program, except for Tony. He's the Medicare guru and he has a clinic and so forth, but he's a great resource with us. Um, and before you would start our program, you would sit down and meet with me to make sure it's a good fit. Because just like you want your clients to meet their goals, anyone in our program, we want you to meet the goal of actually following through and starting um, the program. I hope I, I don't even know if my website's up and going, Sue. Um, we, we've switched it from Kajabi to another host. So I, I haven't even seen it. So good luck if you look at it. I don't know what it looks like. Um, so on the website, this is, it talks about who this is for. It talks about qualifications. Um, Cause again, we're not, we don't just accept everyone into our program. Um, and we've divided it into level systems. So when we first started, we did it in a one year program, which was massive. Um, and now we divided it into levels. So level one is just for those therapists that are ready to get started or maybe have started, but aren't ready to see clients yet. Um, so we get you ready so that you are 100% comfortable going out to start seeing clients. And that's level one. And you can't move on into our other programs until you pass that um, and do everything you need because we just see so many people out there trying to cut corners and you need to have a good base. Otherwise your tower is gonna crumble. Um, and then also you will um, be an age-friendly healthcare system. Um, you will have completed the application process for that because again, I believe strongly that we need to be providing that quality care um, across the spectrum. So what it includes is pretty much everything you guys need to get started. Your business essentials um, as far as getting everything set up within the state, getting everything set up you need for your business, um, your insurance credentialing. Um, two of our therapists in the last two weeks got credentialed with Medicare in six days. Oh my gosh, it was taking people 90 to 120 days before. So I'm super stoked on that. Um, marketing templates and training, um, policy and procedure training. Um, again, a lot of people cut corners in this area and that's definitely not the area I would cut corners in. Um, so an attorney, um, well, a couple of attorneys created the policy and procedure manual, you know, it costs over $11,000. So you can do it and hire your own attorneys or you can be part of the program um, where you're doing it with the group of us. So it's kind of like a cost sharing, right? Um, the business forms, um, EMR and billing training. So we do utilize HelloNote um, EMR and there are other EMRs out there, but why it's so helpful that we are in connection with an EMR is because then Steve with um, Hello Note, he can actually go in to our clients, our therapy business builder members and see what's going on. Like if you're having a problem with your documentation, he can log in and say, hey, this is what's going on. This is what you need to do. When you're doing billing, if something isn't going through, we can log in and see it. Um, so it just really depends on, or it really just helps us provide better quality care. Because if it was some other um, documentation system, we don't have ability to access that and see what's going on behind the scenes. Um, so they offer, you know, a, a great um, discount um, for our therapists with that. And so basically, what we did is we took our big program that we've had for the last couple of years and divided it down into different levels. And then we put the bare minimal in it. And then if people want more, they can add on. But we've had people successfully go through the level one without adding on anything because you have everything in there um, that you need. 
Um, so the, it's a three month program because we don't want people hanging on in there forever where, you know, you're going to get in there, get your business set up, get everything you need and ready to start seeing clients. Um, with our program, it's valued at way over 20,000. Um, we have bi-monthly group coaching calls only for people in level one. Um, and you'd be surprised what we get accomplished in those coaching calls. We have um, monthly EMR and billing support calls. Um, we have accountability trackers. Um, we have tons of documents, private Facebook group, all of that kind of stuff. But basically, we want to make sure that everyone who signs up for our program gets what they signed up for. So our promise is if you follow the program and you do what we guide you to do, you will have your own mobile hybrid practice focused around serving older adults completely set up and ready to accept clients with confidence that it's done right and with the satisfaction that you're part of the age-friendly healthcare system. So that's our promise to you. Um, the price is $2,350. Um, pretty sure you're not gonna find um, a way to build your own business for that much any, <laughs> anywhere out there. Um, it will be moving up to $299 um, next week, a week from today, and we do have payment plans. Um, but you have to schedule a discovery call because I do want to sit down and make sure you fully understand the program. And then I need to get to know you to make sure that um, it's a right fit for you as well. Um, so we, New York and California are two special um, two special places that we highly recommend that you get an attorney. Um, and we do work with an attorney that has set up um, numerous businesses um, in New York. He's actually in New York. Um, and have in California as well. And then our level two program, which I'm not gonna go into um, tonight, it's for those therapists that have started a business, um, but they're really not getting anywhere. And this one, we have in-depth coaching calls, one-on-one -on -one calls, as well as group calls. And then we have a variety of other things that you need, such as Develop, you know, creating your key performance indicators, getting your um, CRM in place, um, and really getting it. So our goal in our level two program is so that you get it, so that your business is bringing in five to ten thousand dollars a month. And then once you get to that five to ten thousand dollars a month, then we move people onto the level three program, and that means taking you out of your business to working on it and bringing in other people um, doing the work in it. So if you have questions, reach out. Um, but if you're interested in starting your business, working with older adults, we'd love to help you. Um, you, can, you can do it on your own as well. Um, we have the startup checklist, we have business plans, we have webinars and so forth. Um, I just, this program was created because my business coach said, Kara, what do you wish you would have had when you started your practice? Um, so everything in the program is what I wish I had. Um, and then he asked me how much, you know, would you, would you pay for that program? I'm like, oh, 10,000 or more. Um, so our big program when we started it was all in one and that was a $10,000 program, but now we've broken it up into the, into the level steps. Um, yes, Karen, if you have a question, you can um, either type it in the chat or the Q&A, or um, I can unmute you. Um, we, help, we help teach all, that's one of the big things we cover is um, in our program is how to build Medicare, how to, um, you know, your documentation you need, the um, policies you need to have in place for your business, um, you know, what happens when you submit your billing and it comes back denied, what do you need to do? So we go over all of that stuff in our programs and then we have that support in place. So when you guys come up with difficulties or problems, you have someone to reach out to um, and help. Okay, and I know it's getting late, so I'm gonna push on through. Um, I want to just tell you guys about some new exciting collaborations that we haven't announced yet. Um, one of them is the Senior Home Safety Specialist Certification. Um, so we've been working with them. Um, gosh, when we start, Sue, it's been a long time since we started with them. Um, and we... Uh, yeah, quite a 
yeah, like even before Christmas, I think. Um, but we are utilizing their their program along with um, our certification um, program as well. But they have given um, special discounts. So if anyone wants to do the senior home safety specialist certification, um, all next level OT members get $50 off um, with a coupon code NLOT. Um, therapy business builder members and those in our HAST um, certification program get $100 off. And it is like a, is it $299 or $399? I can't remember. It's getting too late. Um, also, we are working with them on some exciting new technology type opportunities for the older adult population that will be coming out with some webinars hopefully soon. I have all of this stuff sitting over here in the box. If life would just be normal for a few days or a month, it would help. Um, again, I always like to just give a shout out to Mike Chua because um, he does do um, a live online Alzheimer's disease and dementia care seminars. And he um, is always gives out special discounts for our group. So I'll be sending those out in the post email. Um, I have been working for the last few months on an orthopedic technology type thing that I'm hoping is going to be go over really well for mobile therapists um, that have a connection with orthopedic surgeons. So keep your eye on, out for that. And if you work with orthopedic surgeons, reach out to me because um, I need to talk to you. And Finally done. Okay, so special gift for you guys um, for holding on to us um, for this long um, is one of the big things that we see is people just have a huge fear of getting started. Um, and Alicia Komar was one of my mentors when I first started, and she's one of the mentors in our program for pediatrics, cash-based, and so forth. And she did a webinar on imposter syndrome, um, and it covers things like learning how, you know, you can stop feeling like a fraud, removing self-doubt, feel more confident, and recognizing your value. Um, so she did this webinar and there was a charge for people to attend, but she's graciously allowed me to send that out to you guys free of charge. Also, if you didn't get my emails, um, if you didn't get my emails, you also have access to our visionary summit we did last year in 2020. Um, I sent out an email on Monday and gave a week free of that. And that has tons of great free resources as well. So that's our thank you gift just for sticking around with us. Um, and really, we just want therapy professionals to know that you can do this on your own. You don't have to work for someone else and have the crappy productivity standards and stuff like that out there. Um, and yeah, please post any questions you have. So thank you for those that have attended and we'll hang around to ask questions um, and then you'll get a post email with um, things in there. Um, so we are in the process of the AOTA um, program. Um, so that my application, well, it has to be submitted by um, the end of this month. So it will eventually um, fingers crossed, be approved for AOTA CEUs, um, but we are putting it out there now because we've had so many people that want to get started with it, um, and not everyone worries about the CEUs, so we will be putting it out there now, and then as soon as we get the AOTA approval, we will be adding um, that as well, so um, it's just, it's a long application. <laughs> <laughs> and like I said, we, you know, life happens. Um, both Sue and I, between our family members, have had so many things go on in the last few months because this webinar was supposed to be in, in April um, during AOTA month, and it's just happening now. So, yeah. And I think uh, the other thing is we do treat patients. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I saw five patients today and some of them were quite a long ways of a drive. So, yes. Yeah, I know. That's what <clears throat> some people ask about the program. And I'm like, 
I don't know, when I was a student or when, when I was a student, you know, did our teachers do what they actually taught? Um, that always mattered to me. And when I taught, I wanted to be sure I did what um, kept working so I could offer advice to students. And the same thing with, with this is we do the thing um, every day. Um, and it's just exciting. Um, I haven't even told you, Sue, so a cancer center in our town has been loving what we do and they are now sending their clients to us. So um, just doors continue to open as you, as you go and get out there. I, I have a case manager for an insurance company now that um, sends me all their clients because they can't get other OT services that offer the same. And then I just got the referral that I was talking about the last 20 page fax I just received. It's like the case manager in our doctor's office specifically requested this therapy company because of the services. Yeah, isn't that I know? It's awesome. People appreciate the appreciate you. I had I had a client that we just started, um, and she actually is starting as a home health part A. Um, but she just came home from a TCU, a transitional care unit, and she was not happy at all. Um, and it's just interesting, but she was, she was so happy with even just our first session and what we did and why don't other people do this? So, and just the relationships that you get to build with these clients, like I think last week or two weeks ago, one of my clients, their daughter had a wedding in their backyard. Um, and they invited me to come, you know, to the ceremony. How cool you know, I've gone to clients birthday parties or, or valve renewals. And, you know, these are things that I, I don't feel like I got that same connection with my clients when I was working for some larger healthcare organizations. So yeah, well, you get really entwined. I mean, especially Rachel with like the, the dementia care and working with those caregivers. I mean, it's huge. They don't have anyone else out there and Helping them navigate is, is really important. Yeah. Well, and I think for me, it's hearing, we've been looking for someone like you for years. This is the first time in how many years we've been able to solve that problem, get this young adult into the bathroom, be able to you know, take care of a person or we don't know what we would have done. Yeah. And getting that thank you with yours. Yeah. 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 Okay, going once or twice because I mean it's late for Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> a little past my bedtime, but that's okay. <laughs> so, any last minute questions you have? If you have any quick, go ahead and post them. Otherwise, you know, reach out to us. Um, and I always email is the best for me. Um, Facebook Messenger is a nightmare um, because we just have too many messages flying in and out that it's hard to keep up. So, so yeah, have a fabulous night. Thank you, Sue and Rachel, for your guys' time and education all the therapists out there. So, oh, just a second. We have a question about B in California. So I think is California in more than one region for it's Mac, I can't remember for sure, but I think it might be, which is, I think, I don't know if you apply, you can just add a second area to your application. Um, it's not that hard or that difficult. And there's no extra cost. And, you know, um, that works out pretty good, I think. Is that, did that cover that question? I don't, I must have missed that. Yeah, so, and Julie said yes, there's two areas. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, so for example, I work on a state border and I have licenses in two states. I would need to contract with both MACs um, or the Medicare intermediaries. And so, you know, it's, it's easy to do. You just add another one to it if that's what you want to do. And I think, Kara, you were in the process of doing that at one stage, right? Yeah. So I live on the border of North Dakota, Minnesota. Um, like, you know, in minutes is Minnesota. So what I did is I had to set up a business in um, Minnesota and I 
was able to set it up as a foreign entity. And then, and then I, I had to have an address there. And there's a variety of different ways that you can get an address in another city or another state. Um, I just happened to use um, a colleague's address. And then I got credentialed with Medicare using um, that location and so forth in that state. Um, so there are different ways that you can get an address um, for a clinic location if mobile. Um, the UPS store, um, there's, I think, FedEx, um, there's online places. Gosh, I have a whole list in our Therapy Business Builder program. Um, but there's a variety of ways you can get an address for a clinic location if you're mobile. I use my home address. I mean, my kids, my kids. All of a sudden, we show up on Snapchat now as home therapy solutions. They're not very impressed, but I don't care. Um, but some people do care because of, you know, confidentiality or depending on what and who you do um, or what and who you do, what you do and who you know. But for me, it doesn't bother me. So hopefully that helps you a little bit there. And I think there was one question, Kara, about... Somebody asked Somebody if PTs can also join the program. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, great question. So our therapy business builder program has OT, PTs, and speech language pathologists in our program, as well as PTAs and OTAs. One of, um, one of our most successful um, therapists is a physical therapy assistant um, that has just been rocking it um, with his mobile hybrid practice. Um, some of the certification programs that we have talked about are geared just to occupational therapists, but our therapy business builder is open to um, all therapists and we've had a variety in, in the program. Okay, I think we covered everything. Okay, you guys have a fabulous night. You can We'll talk to you soon. Thanks everyone.